Well, it's good to see you all. We've got a fun night tonight. Last week was a, a bit of a, a push to get through all the information. I think we'll go a little bit slower tonight. I've gotten requests to talk slower, so I'll be going at this pace tonight. Yes, sir. We do, and um, it's because we, we're having to use the white speakers instead of the, the black one, which we normally do, and so it's just a little bit different system. So, unfortunately, we're, we're still trying to work through that. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and pass around the um, prayer sheet. For those of you who are not familiar with this, we do have a wonderful team that prays for your prayer requests. So, um, what we're going to do is, is pass things up this way back down the middle, and then around this way, so make sure we hit every table. And then also I will pass through the uh, attendance sheet. Okay. Good, good, good. I think we're ready to go. All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you humbled and in awe of who you are. You are God. You are awesome. You are holy. And it's such a privilege just to come in your presence and learn more about you. Just open our eyes and our hearts to what you'd have to say to us tonight and direct our steps. And uh, just speak to us the words that you have us uh, learn tonight, Lord. And motivate in us a desire to put into practice um, what you'd have to say to us, Lord, not just information for information's sake, Lord. Let us never do that as we uh, approach your word, Lord. Uh, we know it's transformational. It's not just informational. Again, we love you and praise you, and just bless our time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, last week, I somewhat drenched you with a fire hose survey of the history surrounding and the, the context uh, leading up to the Babylonian captivity. Uh, so let's do a bit of review uh, before we jump in today. Uh, first, we, we prefaced our journey with the, the caveat that, that God is in control of history, that things happen for a reason. Uh, that very important truth about the sovereignty of God is crucial to understand if we are going to get a grasp on uh, the message of Daniel. So when looking at the, at the history leading, leading up to the Babylonian captivity, we need to see that God is orchestrating events. There we go. He is orchestrating events behind the scenes. God is raising up nations for his purposes. Uh, we need to be firmly established in this so that when we get to the prophetic sections of Daniel, we will have a, a rock-solid grasp on the fact that God is not just telling us what will happen, He's telling us what He will accomplish, what He will make happen for His ends and His purposes. And that's the story of Daniel. So, we started last uh, time by looking at uh, Leviticus 26. And how this, this passage uh, serves as a, as a foundation for seeing how God saw his relationship with Israel. And, um, and then how clear God's warnings uh, to Israel were about sin and repentance and how they were constant and inescapable. We looked at the major players in the region at the time. Uh, we looked at um, the history, the back and forth dominance between Assyria and Babylon in the region. Uh, and we saw that Babylon was not primitive you know, at all. They were pioneers in, in calendars and astronomy and mathematics and architecture and irrigation and uh, just about every area. Uh, we took a look at Egypt and Judah and the alliances that they made and then saw how ripe Judah was for judgment. Uh, we then examined the uh, northern kingdom and the fall of uh, Israel and how they were spread across the Assyrian Empire, but there were not ten lost tribes um, as a result. Um, 
We also took an uh, in-depth look at the Battle of Karshemesh, which um, li literally changed the world. And we saw how God's sovereignty arranged all the chess pieces into place uh, for Babylon to, to rise to dominance and then be in a position to uh, conquer and attack Jerusalem. Uh, we also read several passages describing how Jeremiah and um, the other prophets were warning uh, uh, Judah and um, th that Babylon was coming as an instrument of God's judgment and that they should accept this and serve the king of Babylon. That was the, the primary message from the prophets. So, Babylon conquered uh, Jerusalem in three stages. We saw it was in 605, 597, and 586, with the last siege being the most devastating, where Jerusalem was leveled and the city and the temple were burned. Uh, we also saw then how the 70-year period of judgment had two different phases, uh, two different aspects. This, the first was called the servitude of the nation, and this had to do specifically with them uh, being in the land. And then uh, this went from 605 when they were conquered until 536 when Cyrus lets them return to the land, when, when he conquers um, Babylon. And then there was a second overlapping phase of judgment, which is also 70 years, um, called the Desolations of Jerusalem. And this specifically has to do with the city and the temple. And that started in 586 when the temple was destroyed and ends in 516 when the temple is rebuilt. And again, uh, the important thing to keep in mind about this is the second phase was a punishment for not obeying under the first phase. That's a really key point that a lot of commentators miss. Um, the temple did not need to be destroyed. Uh, the uh, city uh, did not need to be leveled. If they had just obeyed the voice of God coming through the prophets and humbled themselves under the rule of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, this could have been avoided. So that brings us to chapter 1, verse 1. It's true. We're going to get into the book of Daniel. So let's start reading in... Uh, Verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So hopefully now, after some background, we have a little understanding of the names and dates and, and context and what's going on. We know who Jehoi Jehoiakim is. He was one of the last kings of Judah who was set up by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt as a puppet king just prior to the battle of Karshemesh. Um, after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, he heard his father had died, and so uh, he rushed back to claim the throne, but just prior to doing that, he um, allowed Jehoiakim to stay on the throne after he swore allegiance to uh, Babylon. So when Nebuchadnezzar uh, returned to um, Babylon to take over the throne, uh, Josephus mentions that he hurries back by the short desert route as quickly as possible. And then the captives and all of the um, implements and articles from the temple, they were brought back by the normal route, by going up and over the, uh, the Fertile Crescent. This first chapter really um, it serves as an introduction. He's setting the scene for the upcoming stories and visions. We learn about Daniel's identity, his circumstance, his character, how he rose to prominence in, um, in Babylon. We saw that for hundreds of years, God had warned his people to repent, and they didn't, and judgment finally came. And this verse dives right into that judgment. A, for, a, a few issues we need to address right in this first verse is there is an apparent contradiction, where Daniel 1.1 seems to contradict another account of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Jeremiah, uh, what this comes down to really is just a question of an accession year versus the first year. Jeremiah's reckoning versus Daniel's. So in Jeremiah 25, 1, it says that the first year of Nebuchadnezzar was the fourth year of Jehoiakim, when Daniel says it's the third year. Well, the difference is uh, in the Babylonian uh, way of reckoning uh, royal reigns, they did not account the accession year as the first year. Um, so um, Daniel, being an official in Babylon, would use that method. So there's really no contradiction. 
the Jewish way of reckoning was that any part of a year counts for a whole year. Um, I don't know if there's, well, I know there's, there's one lawyer in the house, Roger's a lawyer, he, he would probably understand this, that uh, any part of a day counts as a billable for the whole day, right? So that's, it's really a non-issue. The second issue in verse 1 is um, it says that Nebuchadnezzar was the king. It actually calls him Nebuchadnezzar the king, but he wasn't yet king at this point. He was just the general. Um, but when Daniel wrote this many years later, Nebuchadnezzar was definitely the king, and it would have been highly disrespectful to not refer to him as such. And so um, Daniel probably even muttered under his breath, may he live forever when he wrote this. That was the kind of respect that Nebuchadnezzar commanded. Um, so uh, we'll see that when um, we get to chapter 5, how he is uh, revered. So those are just a few um, issues in, in verse 1. Again, this is the, the, first, the first of three sieges that we discussed last time. We saw a bit of who Nebuchadnezzar is, at least in a, an introduction, introductory way to uh, history of the nation and the kingdom he came from. We'll, we'll look much more into who he is as a king and a man as we get into chapters 2 and 4. So verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. So even though uh, Nebuchadnezzar left Jehoiakim on the throne, we saw last time how three years later, Jehoiakim, having listened to the false prophets, uh, later rebelled against Babylon, which caused the second siege and a war that lasted five years until 597, which... Uh, that was the second deportation. At that point, Jehoiakim was bound in chains and uh, was to be taken off to Babylon. But before Nebuchadnezzar could get there, he died. Jehoiakim died, and his son Jehoiachin was made king. Second uh, Chronicles 36, 6 that says that Jehoiakim was put in chains and um, uh, to be taken off to Babylon, but he never ended up going there. Um, Jeremiah 22, 18, and 19 describes how he died and was given a donkey's burial and thrown outside the city gates. So he was not very highly regarded. Uh, his son Jehoiachin, who is also called Jeconiah, or Coniah sometimes for short, he's really an enigmatic character. Uh, he became king when he was 18 years old. Um, and there is actually an example here of a copyist error. In, in 2 Chronicles 36, 9, it says that he was 8 years old, not 18. Uh, but 2 Kings 24, 8, it states correctly that he was 18 years old when he came, became king. And he only reigned for three months. Another copyist error in that same verse says it was three months and ten days. Uh, regardless, he was, he was quickly deposed by Nebuchadnezzar who, who, slipped him, uh, who shipped him off to Babylon. Yeah. Uh, 2 Kings 24, 8 has it correct. And then in 2 Chronicles 36, 9, that has uh, uh, the, the variant reading. So 2 Kings, 2 Kings 24, 8. 24, 24. And the one that said he's 8 year old is 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 36, 9. And the, the, the difference really is it's just like a, a little mark on the top of a letter. And so it's easy for those things to get you know, smudged. And whatnot, but we have so many copies of of these texts that it's very easy to find out what the original reading is. Um, but for for Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, I'm sorry, there is a very interesting curse that God places on him. He's also called Jeconiah, and the, the, this curse gives rise to a discussion a discussion surrounding the necessity of the virgin birth. Now, you may have come across this before, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, in the, the two genealogies of Jesus, in uh, Matthew and Luke, we're, we're given a puzzle that provides us with an interesting challenge. You know, how many of us just skip over genealogies when reading through Matthew and Luke? Um, you know, who would have thought that these, these seemingly innocent lists of names contain a riddle that when you decipher it, uh, give us a glimpse into the sovereignty of God that's fairly astounding. Uh, when reading the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, we notice that they're different. They're both supposed to be genealogies of the line of Messiah. So how are they different? What's going on? 
The key to deciphering the message points us right back to the time that we are discussing, when Jeconiah, a king who only reigned for three months, was declared to be so wicked that God cursed his entire family tree. Uh, we see his uh, actual bloodline um, was cursed in Jeremiah 22, where God says, No man of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of Judah. Well, that seemingly posed a big problem for God. The problem was that this was the royal line. Uh, the Messiah had to come from this line. How would God get around this curse that he placed on Jeconiah's line and provide a Messiah through the line of David? Well, not surprisingly, it, it took a miracle. Uh, in 2 Samuel 7, 13, God had promised David that his throne would never end. Uh, with this blood curse, the promise seemed to be in jeopardy. What God does, though, is to have Matthew record uh, his genealogy, trace it down through the royal line, through Jeconiah, all the way to uh, Joseph, uh, the husband of Mary. Um, this genealogy ties Jesus through legal adoption by Joseph to the royal line, uh, but there's no blood descendant still sitting on the throne, since Jesus is not Joseph's actual son. So Jesus is the legal heir to the throne of David. Uh, but what about the bloodline? If Jesus didn't share the bloodline of David, then he couldn't be considered an heir to the throne. So what God does is demonstrate through the genealogy in Luke uh, that Jesus does share the bloodline of David, but traces that genealogy through his mother Mary, who does share blood relationship with Jesus. And this genealogy traces Jesus' line uh, back through Mary to David, but through one of his other sons, not Solomon, through, uh, through Nathan. So Jesus is related to David in two different ways. He is entitled to the throne both by blood and by legal title. And this could only have been accomplished by the virgin birth, uh, where the Messiah had no earthly father to pass the bloodline through. So these genealogies reveal a God who is sovereign. If you're looking, you can see the, the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in the most unlikely of places, even in genealogies. I know some, there are some that argue that um, legal adoption wasn't really in, in play or in force or used at that time, but there are other scholars that argue it was. And so um, that, I think, is the best supported position on that. Um, as a side trail, which I promised you from time to time, uh, there's another interesting example of a seemingly innocuous genealogy that you might normally skip through when, when you're reading. Uh, it's found in Genesis chapter 5. Now I have to warn you, this is one of those things that I mentioned at the beginning of this class that we may dance on the edge a little bit from time to time. There is, some, there is support for this, and I'll explain what that means. You know, But um, what I think this does is, is really just serves to demonstrate the divine fingerprint of God behind the text. It's not the kind of thing you the build doctrine on, but it's really fun to look at. So take it for what it's worth. So the entire chapter of uh, Genesis 5 is a genealogy that begins with Adam and travels down 10 generations and ends with Noah. And we've read these names many times in the Bible, but we have always read them in Hebrew. Okay, so what are their names? Um, how, how do we translate them? What are the meanings? Uh, so let's translate them into English as close as we can get and see what we find. Again, some of these are, are really clear translations and some are possible translations. Uh, but before we begin, I want to ask you a little Bible trivia question. Okay. If Methuselah was the oldest man in the Bible, how could he have died before his father? No one. All right, we'll get there. We'll see, we'll see this as we go. So we begin here with um, Adam. His uh, name is an easy one. It means man. When God said he created man, he said he just created Adam. That's the word for man. Uh, his son's name is Seth. That means appointed. Uh, next is Enosh, which can be translated as mortal. Uh, Kenan means sorrow. Uh, next is Mahalalel, which is a mouthful, but it means the blessed God. Um, his son is Yared, which can be translated as shall come down. Enoch uh, can be translated as teaching. Methuselah is a really interesting one. His death, uh, his death shall bring is, is a way you can translate that. 
Apparently, Methuselah's father was given a prophecy of the great flood and was told that as long as his, as his son lived, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. Now, apparently, the uh, same year Methuselah died, the flood came. And it's Jewish tradition that it was actually seven days after his death. Um, his life is, um, it can be seen as a beautiful symbol of God's grace in that it's the longest showing how extensive God's grace really is. And if you haven't seen it yet, haven't figured it out yet, the answer to our quiz, if you look just above Methuselah, his father was Enoch, who never died. That's right. So that's how <laughs> Methuselah could have died before his father. Next we have uh, Lamech, uh, which means the despairing. And then finally we have Noah, which means rest. Now if we, if we put all these names uh, together into a, a sentence with some connectives to make the English sound good, I think you might be surprised what we find. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest. It's really cool, but what happened to Cain and Abel? Why didn't they get there before Seth in the line? They weren't part of the, the genealogy in, in Genesis 5. So no, they were four. No, no, in the genealogy in, in Genesis 5, it, takes, it goes from Adam through Seth. That's, that's the kingly line, through Seth. Okay, but they just didn't get listed. Right, because it's just, it's just the kingly line, just one father, one father, one son, all the way through. It's not, it's not a family tree. Got it. So, slow, thank you. Yeah. So, um, I think that's pretty amazing. I kind of get chills every time I, I hear that because it's the gospel message spelled out in a genealogy in Genesis. It is on a, a chart in your notes. There we go. <laughs> um, but, but what's amazing, it, 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 that, that one sentence foreshadows the entire plan of redemption. Um, by the way, if you're interested in looking this up, the, the meanings for yourself, uh, a basic lexicon or concordance probably won't help you. Help you. you need to look up the Hebrew roots uh, to really find the base meanings. And like I mentioned, this is something that... Uh, it's, it's a little bit on the edge, but it does have some foundation. Back in, in seminary, I checked with my Hebrew profs on this, and they verified, well, some of the meanings are clearer than others. Um, the, uh, they're all within the semantic range to really fit uh, these definitions for the most part. So I know some Hebrew scholars don't agree with this, so take it with a grain of salt, but I think it's pretty, pretty cool if it, is, if, it is, if it is valid. So... We were looking at verse 2, and we remember that Jehoiakim dies before Nebuchadnezzar arrives in 597 at the end of the second siege. His son Jehoiachin, or uh, Jeconiah, reigned for three months, and he has that curse placed on him. Then his uncle Zedekiah is placed on the throne um, by Nebuchadnezzar. And now we'll see that Zedekiah also listens to the false prophets. And eventually rebels against Babylon. Now this was what causes the destruction of Babylon in 586. Uh, but there's an interesting prophecy about Zedekiah in Ezekiel 12:13. Uh, it says that um, that he will be he will be caught trying to escape Jerusalem, and he will be brought to Babylon. And though he will never see Babylon, he will die there. Um, it's interesting to see how literally and precisely God fulfills this prophecy. In 2 Kings 25, 6 through 7, it reads, Then they captured the king, that's Zedekiah, and brought him to the king of Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar, at Riblah. And he passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. So he literally never saw Babylon, yet he died there. We see a little picture of what Nebuchadnezzar's like. That was the last thing he wanted Zedekiah to see was his children being slaughtered. So Nebuchadnezzar was pretty brutal. Uh, so back to verse 2. Um, it says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. It was not Nebuchadnezzar's doing. This was the work of God. This is why God called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Uh, this is a lesson that um, Nebuchadnezzar will learn in spades in chapter 4, that God is in control. 
It also says in verse 2 that uh, some of the vessels of the house of God uh, were, were brought. At this point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar did, did not take everything. Every time there was a siege, he took a little bit more. And then at the final siege in 586, he took, he took whatever was left. The uh, question is, why, um, why were they taken? Why did he bother doing that? Well, like we mentioned, when you conquered a people, taking their idols and statues, it demonstrated that your God was more powerful than their God. Of course, Israel didn't have idols and statues, and so they took you know, the gold and silver items from the temple that were valuable and things were, that were used in the temple services. Uh, the temple of uh, Marduk in Babylon, where these vessels were taken, has been excavated. Uh, this temple will come into play again later in chapter 5. Uh, here is an artist's rendering of what it uh, might have looked like, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, here's another uh, artist's rendering here. Um, and there's also a model that has been constructed, uh, constructed in the Pergamon Museum uh, on Museum Island in Berlin. And we'll see that, that, uh, um, that museum again in, in just a few minutes here. Uh, we mentioned how these folks all the way over in Babylon knew about these treasures. It was Hezekiah and his pride that gave it away. But uh, what was God's reaction to um, what Hezekiah did. Um, let's turn to uh, Isaiah 39. Take a look at what, um, how God reacted to what Hezekiah did. So Isaiah 39, verse 1. It says, at that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon. Again, this is like 100 plus years prior to Nebuchadnezzar, so we're looking back. Um, the king of Babylon sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and his whole armory and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Uh, then, Hez uh, then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. Again, Babylon hadn't ridden, risen to prominence yet, but um, they will shortly. Verse 4, he said, uh, what, they ha what, they have, sorry, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you shall beget, shall be taken away. And they shall become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. So God was not very happy. But what was Hezekiah's reaction to what God said? Verse 8, uh, Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, for there will be peace and truth in my days. That's pathetic. He was saying, at least it won't happen on my watch. So, that's pretty crazy. Was he showing off, or you just, did God think he was just showing off his material treasures, and that was a lack of humility? Or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we talked about the first week that this was, um, this was after Hezekiah complained to God about what, God telling him, you're about to die. Hezekiah whined and complained and said, okay, I'll, I'll give you 15 more years. And then that happened at, in, in that 15-year time frame, as well as Manasseh being born as well, the evil king Manasseh. So lots of bad things happened. So in addition to the, uh, the temple of Marduk, there's quite a bit of solid evidence in historical writings and in um, archaeology for the events that happened in the Babylonian captivity. In the middle of the 19th century, this area was, was a hotbed of uh, research and uh, among the many archaeological discoveries that confirm the account written in the Bible, here are a few um, highlights. Uh, first, we have the, the Lakish letters. Uh, in these, we, uh, important light has been shed upon the final days of Judah. Um, when these were discovered, uh, these uh, ostraca, clay tablets with um, writing and ink, were written in an ancient cursive script. Uh, belonging to the 7th century B.C. They were discovered at Lachish, 
among the ruins of a small guard room just outside the city gate. Then a few years later, three inscribed potsherds were uh, also found at the site, and they um, also contained names and lists from that period just before the fall of Jerusalem in 586. Most of these letters were from a Jewish commander named Hosea, who was stationed at an outpost of Lachish, um, who was responsible for uh, interpreting signals from, from Azekah and Lachish. Um, these these uh, communications uh, mention the political and religious turmoil of the last days of Judah uh, and reveal the, um, the intensity of this time period and confirm you know, that what was written in the Bible by, by Jeremiah was true. Jeremiah 34, 7 makes mention of this. Uh, it says, when the kings of Babylon's uh, army fought against Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah that were left against Lachish and Ezekiah, for only these fortified cities remain of the cities of Judah. Uh, next we have the, Babylon, the Babylonian Chronicle. And this, um, because of the Babylonian Chronicles, it makes it, makes it um, possible to very precisely date the fall of Jerusalem, in the, the second fall in, in 597, um, confirming the biblical accounts um, uh, both in 597 and 586. So the Babylonian Chronicle reads, it says, In the seventh month, um, in the month of Chislev, the king of Babylon assembled his army, and after he had invaded the land of Hatti, which is Syria and Palestine, he laid siege to the city of Judah. On the second day of the month of Adara, he conquered the city and took the king, which was Je Jehoiachin, prisoner. He installed in his place a king of his own choice, that's Zedekiah, and after he had received rich tribute, he sent them forth to Babylon. Uh, when well, comparing this text from uh, ancient Babylon, uh, with the Babylonian invasion in 2 Kings, how it's described there, it just demonstrates very clearly the precision and accuracy of the biblical text. So that was an important find. Uh, next we have the striding lion. And this uh, colorful lion of glazed brick with its mouth open in a threatening roar, this once de um, decorated the processional way in ancient Babylon. And there's, here's an artist's rendering of the processional way leading up to the, um, the gate, a massive gate named for the Mesopotamian goddess of love and war, Ishtar, um, whose symbol was the lion. The Ishtar gate was um, one of the prized excavations of that area, and it has been rebuilt in that same uh, museum in Berlin. So no doubt that any, any Jewish... A prisoner coming to Babylon would have gone through this processional way and seen these lions. So it's been taken to the museum. It's not there for ISIS to destroy now. No, actually, they have. Uh, they found the foundations for this, and it goes down like 47 feet. Um, and they, but they took a lot of the um, the bricks to Berlin and rebuilt it there. But it's also been rebuilt in Babylon as well. Saddam worked for many years trying to rebuild Babylon because he considered himself the ne next Nebuchadnezzar. And so he, he rebuilt this. He rebuilt the, uh, the, the, hall, the banquet hall, what we're talking about in, in Daniel 5, and some other, other key places as well. Yeah. yeah. There's also a line very similar to that in the Boston Museum where it shows the wall and it shows the line on it. Okay, yeah. Um, so the Ishtar Gate, uh, this is one of the uh, eight gates of the inner city of Babylon. And this was built during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And like I said, the foundations have been found. Um, and uh, this has been reconstructed. And there it is in the, in the uh, British Museum, I'm sorry, the Berlin Museum. Uh, they uh, rebuilt it made from uh, glazed bricks. And so for somehow the, the original height of this would be a little bit different. The reconstructed height is 47 feet. Um, it was one of the eight gates of the inner city of Babylon, built around 575, and really is one of the most impressive monuments rediscovered in the uh, ancient Near East. The um, Ishtar Gate was decorated with glazed brick reliefs in tiers of dragons and young bulls. The gate itself was a double gate, and on its south side was a large antechamber uh, leading up to and through the gate uh, ran a stone brick avenue, which we talked about the, as the processional way. And it was, it's been traced uh, to a length of over half a mile. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar dedicated 
the great Ishtar gate to the goddess Ishtar. It was the main entrance into Babylon. And this, like I said, this is one of the many elaborate building projects that he undertook. Uh, and thus he, he proudly boasts in Daniel 4.30, is this not Babylon that I have built? And I believe he comes to regret that statement later. Uh, the dedication inscription on the gate reads, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the faithful prince appointed by the will of Marduk, the highest of princely princes, beloved of Nebu, a prudent counsel who has learned to embrace wisdom, who fathom their divine being and reveres their majesty, the untiring governor who always takes to heart the care of the cult of Esagila and Ezida, and is constantly concerned with the well-being of Babylon and Borsippa, the wise, the humble, the caretaker of Esagila and Ezida, the firstborn son of Nabopolassar, the king of Babylon. So that is the Ishtar Gate. Next we have the Jehoiachin inscription. This is one of the clay tablets that reveal the, the presence of the Judean royal prisoners um, uh, in Babylon. They were excavated from an arched building near the Ishtar Gate. Uh, these cuneiform texts, which are dated between 590, uh, 595 and 570 BC, uh, contain lists of rations of barley and oil that were issued to the captive princes and artisans, including an inscription that says, uh, Yaukin, king of the land of Yahud, which is a direct reference to Jehoiachin, and um, some of the other tablets also mention his five sons who accompanied him to Babylon. Next is the Eliakim seal. Uh, this seal bears the inscription, the property of Eliakim, the steward of Jehoiachin. It is from Debir, located 13 miles uh, southwest of uh, Hebron. It was excavated by William F. Albright in 1926. Although recently this find has been called into question and may have been misidentified by date. So, uh, but it is another uh, key uh, discovery. Next is the Nabonidus Stele. Uh, Nabonidus was known to be the king on the throne at the time that Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered Babylon. However, in, 19, in 1854, Sir Henry Rawlinson found an inscription which excavated, uh, was excavated at the ancient city of Ur, where Abraham was from. And that stated that Nabonidus associated his son with him on the throne, a bel shar Usur, and allowed him the royal title as well. So that was a, a significant find in the history of biblical archaeology to confirm that what, Bab, uh, that, uh, what, what was in uh, Daniel chapter 5 was actually accurate, because um, biblical scholars have been basically laughed at for many years because of that. Um, next we have the uh, Cyrus Cylinder. So at Babylon, archaeologists discovered the Cyrus Cylinder, a clay cylinder with inscriptions which record details about the capture of Babylon by Cyrus. And there's a lot of information about this. This, this uh, inscription says, I am Cyrus, king of the world. When I entered Babylon, I did not allow anyone to terrorize the land. I kept in view the needs of the people and the sanctuaries and to promote their well-being. I put an end to their misfortune. The great God has delivered all the lands into my hand, the lands that I have made to dwell in a peaceful habitation. I think that that, that phrase, the great God, actually refers to the God of Israel. Um, it seems like that's, that's, that's maybe not how he would uh, refer to his own gods. And he, there's such detail with which I, Isaiah describes his conquering of Babylon 150 some odd years prior to the event. We'll take a look at this when we get to chapter 5. It's pretty amazing. Um, so I think he, he recognized that God had something to do with it. And then he, obviously he let the people go back to, uh, to Jerusalem. Um, so according to the uh, cuneiform on the Cyrus Cylinder, he was favored by Marduk and the other gods who desired for um, Nabonidus and Belshazzar to be dethroned and divine help will be given to Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus reestablished their real, uh, religious practices and was a very benevolent and gracious ruler. Uh, he was responsible for the return of Jews to Jerusalem. And um, like I said, we'll get into that in uh, chapter 5. So, back to verse 2. Um, it mentions there, um, brought them to the land of Shinar. Okay, the land, land of Shinar is used elsewhere in the scriptures as a designation for Babylon. It's really just like the area or the region. So it's sometimes called the land of the Chaldees, the land of Shinar, or Babylon, or Babylonia. 
Um, as to the vessels that were taken, the instruments that the, the priests would use for temple service, uh, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem has spent the last 30 years or so refashioning and, and creating nearly all of the gold and silver implements that are going to be used uh, to operate the uh, temple once it's erected again. And it will be erected again. Uh, in addition to very clear passages in Daniel 9 um, that talk about this, three times in the New Testament it mentions the need for this rebuilt temple. Um, here are some of the, the photos um, of uh, some of the implements that have been fashioned. The menorah, um, made from a single piece of solid gold, stands in the southern side of the sanctuary. Here's a picture of the one that's actually been refashioned in the Temple Institute. Uh, each morning, a priest prepares and rekindles the wicks. The central wick, which is known as the western candle, is required to burn perpetually. Uh, the oil and wicks of this candle are changed in such a fashion to, to ensure that it will never be extinguished. Uh, there's also the uh, cleaning vessel of the lampstand, the menorah. Uh, the table of showbread in the northern side of the sanctuary. Uh, there's an artist's rendering of that. Uh, this table is made of wood overlaid with gold. Here's a picture of the actual one that's been refashioned. Um, upon it are placed the 12 loaves of showbread. Each Sabbath, the loaves are, are, are simultaneously removed and replaced by fresh loaves so as to ensure that, that uh, the loaves remain perpetually on the table. Um, I think they're, they're big, wide loaves, and so they slide them into those holders. I think that's how that works. I saw a picture of the loaves. They're pretty, pretty good size. Yeah, that's an artist rendering. That's from, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I always wondered why did they call it show That's a good question. And I, I've heard that, and it's, it's one of the many things that has slipped out of my leaky brain. So I, I can look that up and, and, and let you know. Okay. There is an answer to that. Okay. Um, all right, so the um, altar of incense, which is located in the center of the sanctuary, and there's the one that's been refashioned. Um, uh, that stands to the north, um, I'm sorry, let's see, between, be, between the menorah to the south and the table of showbread to the north, in the center, directly in front of the Holy of Holies. Uh, the incense altar is also made of wood covered with gold, and um, in order to allow uh, the priests to perform this most prized of offerings, uh, a daily lot was drawn, and only priests who had never done it before were allowed in that, um, that lottery. Um, here are also the incense, uh, the incense chalice, which um, served that as well. And here's some brass uh, measuring cups that they are going to use. So the next is the large uh, mitzrach, which is uh, the priest collects the blood uh, from the sacrifice into the mitzrach and then spills the blood onto the corner of the altar. There's the one that's actually been refashioned. And here's a picture of them spilling the blood into the, the corner. Um, we also got pictures here of the, the vessels uh, for the water and wine libations. There's for the water libations and also for the wine. Um, there are also silver and gold shovels. There's the silver one. The gold shovel is used to remove burning coals from the outer altar. And the priest then carries the coals on this shovel into the sanctuary where the coals are used in the golden altar incense, or incense altar. Is there any reason why they use a silver? I believe it's the ones used in the holy place are, are the ones that would be, that would be gold. Uh, and there are dozens and dozens, uh, dozens of other implements and pieces of furniture and articles that, that um, have been refashioned in preparation for what uh, we call the, the tribulation temple. Um, in, a, in addition, we get the, the garments of the high priest. You see um, a close-up here of his chest piece with all the, um, the uh, jewels representing each tribe. We also have the uh, silver trumpets. They're going to be used. And um, because they don't see a difference between this and the millennial temple, the Jews call this the, the third temple. Here's a, a picture of Solomon's, what Solomon's temple might have looked like in operation. 
The one piece that they're not going to fashion is the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, they are going to use the original Ark. There's an, an artist, actually that's a refashioning of what they think it might have looked like. Um, the Ark was not cut up and taken in pieces off to Babylon. There are quite a, a few different theories as to where um, the Ark currently is. Uh, the Jews have always steadfastly maintained that it is in a hidden chamber underneath the Temple Mount. Um, and they say it will re be revealed at the appropriate time. And it's interesting to see that they've never really been concerned about its whereabouts, which kind of uh, lends some credence to that. Another really popular, what's that? Indiana Yeah. Uh, well, another popular uh, explanation was that it was hidden away um, at the time before uh, the king, uh, evil king Manasseh and then taken down to Ethiopia for safekeeping. And it will be returned at the right time. And at that point, they thought uh, a replica had been fashioned to sort of keep its place in, in Jerusalem. So lots of theories. There's eight or nine different theories as to where it, it could have been. But um, as you mentioned, those of us who've seen the movie know exactly where it is. It's in a, a Washington warehouse marked with Army Intel 9906753. So if anyone knows where their warehouse is, we'll be all set. So we are over time a little bit for your break. So let's take about 10 minutes. And hopefully there's some cookies and things in the, in the uh, other room we can um, munch on. Okay. Here we go. On to verse 3. At this pace, we'll probably finish Daniel about the middle of the tribulation period. We'll, we will pick up speed. That was a joke, by the way, because we won't be here during the tribulation. So I just didn't let that, that went by you. All right, verse 3. Then the king ordered uh, Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Uh, the word official uh, here is uh, Saris. Rab Saris is chief of the officials or chief of the eunuchs. And um, there's controversy about that term. Uh, Eunuchs were not necessarily, back then, what we see them as today. Uh, yes, some of them were castrated males when their job description called for that kind of restriction. Uh, but it, it simply meant officer in the court. If you remember, Joseph was um, serving Potiphar, who was a Saris, a eunuch, but he was a court official, a captain of the guard. Um, uh, so having nothing to do with the royal harem, he undoubtedly was not castrated since he was also married. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was, um, in, in Acts chapter 8, he was able to worship in the temple. Uh, so he could not do that if he was castrated. So e even though today the, the term eunuch has come to mean someone serving a king who is castrated, that's not always what it necessarily meant. Uh, to be clear, uh, we don't know if Daniel was that kind of eunuch um, he may or may not have been, but we can't make the case that he was simply on the use of the term alone. Um, in verse 4, it refers to uh, the four young men as children of the royal family and of the nobles. Uh, Daniel was most likely of the royal line. He grew up in privilege. He was obviously very bright and, and stood out even among his peers, the, the best of the best. The question is, why did they take hostages? You know, having the, the children of the, the rulers of the conquered nation you know, would supposedly keep that vassal state from, um, from rebelling, keep them in line. Uh, these children would then be trained for service in Babylon and then uh, often sent back, you know, either to, reign, you know, to, to stand before the king or to sent, be sent back to, their, to rule their own people for Nebuchadnezzar after he had, had trained them. Uh, just a servant state. Uh, yeah. um, these um, ancient cultures, I think, were more shrewd than we maybe give them credit for. Uh, they took the best of the cultures that they conquered, and they, they, they trained these guys. They brainwashed them, as it were, and, and, and conscripted them into service for the king. Uh, they didn't destroy the cultures and the people and the gifts that, um, of, of the cultures they, they defeated. They used them for their advantage. When Cyrus conquered Babylon, he conquered it without a battle. And he ended up using that as a secondary capital. 
It was an amazing city. It was not until um, the Roman Empire do we see the, the wanton destruction of civilizations as they went you know, forth from city to city conquering. Also notice it calls them sons of Israel, not sons of Judah. Uh, there's no longer a distinction made between the northern and southern kingdom. And again, there are no ten lost tribes. We talked about that last time. On to verse 4. It says, uh, Youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed them with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him, the, um, king, uh, the, the, the guard there, the, uh, to teach, him, teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So what were their qualifications? Uh, they had to be intelligent, good-looking, flawless in physical form. It says, youths in whom was no defect. Another reason to possibly say that they were not ca castrated. Uh, they were being, being trained to serve in the king's court, but also to, to possibly rule their people on behalf of Babylon. If they were kings, they needed to be able to reproduce to carry on the family line. Uh, so they were given the best possible education and food uh, to be trained to serve uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 5. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. So what were Daniel's circumstances? They were given a privileged education. Again, this was not some backwater tribal nation. These were the most civilized and highly educated people the world had ever seen. They were offered the king's diet, uh, you know, not scraps from his table. This was the same exact food the king would have eaten. <clears throat> they were trained for three years. Uh, this is like you know, getting a, a graduate degree. You know, as, as Jewish royal youth, they would have gotten the best education that Jerusalem had to offer. And now they were getting the best education the world had to offer. Uh, God certainly trained these young men for the service that he was preparing, him, preparing them for. And it, it is through trials and tribulation that God trains um, and molds men for times of crisis. Um, now, you wouldn't think that this was the kind of testing that prisoners being taken off as slaves would have faced. Uh, the temptation facing them was luxury and opulence and the allure of the nicer things in life. How do you stay faithful when uh, lured into the lap of luxury? You know, surely there, there were other trials facing them later down the road. Uh, but how would these, these privileged 13 or 14 year olds face this subtle challenge? Uh, verse 6 and verse 7, it says, Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to uh, Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. I have to keep reminding myself that these were probably 13 or 14 year old Jewish youths. They were kids. Um, but if, if Nebuchadnezzar had his way, they wouldn't be Jewish uh, for long. His strategy was to strip them of everything they knew. The first thing was um, their name. So he took away their name, which, which is really more than a name. It was, it was really part of your identity. Uh, the king's goal was, was clear, is to change their way of thinking. Yeah. yeah. At that age, they would have been through their um, bar mitzvah, right? Mm -hmm. So they would have had a lot of teaching by the rabbis. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, they probably had the best, best of the best. And they were, I, I think they were clearly outstanding, just looking at them. They were uh, cream of the crop. Otherwise, Nebuchadnezzar, king of the world, wouldn't have bothered with them. So, um, uh, as to their um, uh, being renamed, um, from the time that Adam named the animals in the Garden of Eden, the right to name had, had been the mark of dominion. Uh, the, the change of names was the first step in the process of making these young boys Babylonians. Uh, Babylon st stamped its mark of ownership on these young men. Uh, these four boys... Um, either had uh, 
the shortened name for God, El, or Yahweh, Yah, in their given Hebrew names. Uh, their new names had the name of Babylonian gods in them. So uh, Daniel, whose name means God is judge, or God is my judge, his name was changed to Belteshazzar, which means uh, the god Bel favors. Now don't get, uh, just a side note, don't get Belteshazzar mixed up with Belshazzar, who is the king um, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson in chapter 5. So they're very similar names. Hananiah, whose name means beloved of Yahweh, his name is changed to Shadrach, which uh, means illuminated by the sun god. Uh, Mishael, whose name means who is as God. His name is changed to Meshach, which means who is what the moon god is. And the moon god is the same god that the um, Muslims worship today. Uh, that's an interesting study. Um, and then Azariah, who means, uh, whose name means Yahweh is my help. His name was changed to Abednego, uh, which means servant of Nebo or Marduk. Uh, their changed names communicated that the youths now belonged to the Babylonian gods. The king intended to wipe out any re a reminder of who the true God is. But as we'll see, uh, their, uh, their names were changed, but Babylon could not touch their character or allegiance. Uh, they were placed in a different environment. They were vulnerable to all kinds of influences and temptations. The temptations of the world are sometimes subtle. In this case, luxury, prestige, and power would be their test of faith. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, brainwashing program was to fill the stomach with the sensual, the mind with knowledge and understanding, and stroke the ego with praise and position. And you can see echoes of the, of the devil's typical temptations in that, just like he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden and later with uh, Jesus in the uh, wilderness. Satan's strategies always seem to be the same. 1 John 2.16 um, summarizes this. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And here is a chart that sort of um, lays that out. You can see on the left side, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in 1 John 2.16. Then with Eve, uh, it was the, uh, the fruit was good for food. That's lust of the flesh. It's pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes, and it's um, able to make one wise, that's the pride of, li pride of life. With uh, Jesus in the wilderness, he was tempted to turn stones to bread, the lust of the flesh. He was shown the kingdoms of the world for the taking, if he would only compromise, that's lust of the eyes. And then he was tempted to cast himself down and prove that he is the Son of God, that's the boastful pride of life. And then in Daniel, we see this same uh, three areas. So they were given the option to partake of choice food and drink, lust of the flesh, uh, possibility of getting power and prestige if they would just compromise, lust of the eyes, and then being uh, sought, seek, seeking the king's approval and being highly esteemed would be the pride of life. You know, very often Satan's temptations fall into these same categories. His, his methods uh, may be packaged a little differently. Uh, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Uh, Eve, God placed Eve in a beautiful garden and allowed the devil to tempt her. And now God had brought Daniel and his three friends to a magnificent palace uh, in Babylon to be tempted as well. But just think about how difficult these challenges might have been for these kids. Uh, the king ordered a menu uh, that violated God's law, but this was not taking a stand against an overbearing coach a harsh parent, or maybe for the adults, a new boss. Right? This, these inexperienced youths would have to stand firm against the most powerful ruler who has ever lived. That's saying something. If you think about some of the rulers who have lived, God, God says he is the head of gold. He is the, the most powerful. Uh, how intimidating would that have been? Uh, disobedience meant severe punishment, and obedience to the king's orders would please everyone around them, except for God. Uh, and then also disobedience, even if not punished, could uh, work to their disadvantage in respect to uh, future prospects or future uh, uh, positions. Uh, the king's menu then would have also appealed to 
um, the natural appetites of these four young men. Good food and wine are very appealing. You know, what harm would it do to have some good food, right? Um, they would also be tempted to think, um, you know, has God really been good to us? Why should we be faithful to his laws? You know, we're captive in, in Babylon. Our nation's in, in rubble. Next, we were uh, taught to obey those in authority, so let's obey King Nebuchadnezzar. He's in authority over us. How about, uh, under normal circumstances, God's laws are to be obeyed, but we are in abnormal circumstances. Uh, they might have thought, you know, mom and dad will never, will never know. We're far from home. What, what happens in Babylon stays in Babylon, right? Who would ever know? And then lastly, we're just kids, 13, 14 years old. You know, how, how could you, you know, blame us? Temptations are tests. Uh, we can see um, we can see this from the dual meaning of the words, both in the Hebrew and Greek terms that are translated, either tempt or test, depending on the uh, context. When Satan tempts someone to sin, God then uses that circumstance to uh, test that person's faith. James one two through twelve um, offers insights into that. Um, dual nature of temptation. In, uh, some, some of the verses that we can uh, look at on testing and temptation. James 1, 2, uh, 3, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. <coughs> Notice it doesn't say, do your very best, if at all possible, not to complain very much, or if you can muster the strength, try to suffer in silence. No, it says, consider it joy when you encounter various trials. Trials should be a source of joy to us. That seems so counterintuitive, but that's the goal, I think. Uh, 1 Peter 3.17 says, For it is better, if God should will it so, that you should suffer for doing what is right, rather than for what is doing, uh, doing what is wrong. Doing what is right will sometimes be the cause of, of suffering in our lives. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now we need to read this one carefully. The common understanding is that God will not allow you to go through any trial you cannot handle. He will not allow any circumstance that is beyond what we're able to bear. But is that what it says? No, it says God will not allow temptations to overwhelm us beyond what we're able to bear. We'll always provide a way of escape from the temptation. Uh, Now the next verse, verse 8, begins with a very crucial phrase. In the New American Standard it says, But Daniel made up his mind. For this phrase, I actually like the King James a little bit better here. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now, I don't don't want to go any further into this verse beyond this first phrase. Daniel purposed in his heart. What does that mean? That strikes me as um, a statement of absolute resolve. It strikes me as a statement um, that it's intentional, determined act of precise preparation. And the ESV says, made up his mind. Yeah. So uh, have you ever thought about what your uh, most important stewardship is? Don't answer. I just want you to think about it for a second. Now, there's a lot of, uh, probably quite a few worthy suggestions floating around in your, in your heads right now. But some have taught that your most important stewardship is your heart. Mm -hmm. Everything that you do flows from your heart. So what do you allow to enter your heart, through your eyes, through your thoughts, through what you read and watch and expose yourself to? Guarding your heart and seeing your heart as your most important stewardship may be 
the, uh, the most crucial step, a first step in a life of holiness. And I think that's what we're going to see in, in, in Daniel. So let's camp here for just a little bit with the time we have left and talk about this. Uh, let's break up into groups around tables, maybe five or six, and discuss a few questions with each other. First is, what does it mean to purpose in your heart? What does it really mean? I think there's a, you know, an early, I mean, an, an easy answer just to say he decided. Yeah. But what's really behind that? What, what does it take to purpose something in your heart? What does it mean for Daniel to do this? Another question, what are the most potent causes for temptation in our world today? I think the easy one on that one is, is obviously, you know, there's so much sensuality and sexuality just bombarding our senses constantly. But let's get beyond that. What, you know, what are some of the other deeper uh, roots and causes for temptation? What should our response be to temptation? What strategies or elements of preparation will give us victory over temptation? I think preparation might be the key word there. And I know you may not have time to get, all, to, get to all these, but hopefully this will serve some, uh, uh, some fodder for discussion. But lastly, how might we get to the place where we can consider it all joy when we encounter various trials? That's, that's um, I think, some who are older and wiser in the faith uh, may have to help us with that one because that's a challenging one. So take the last few minutes and just talk about that for, for a few minutes and we'll come back together. Ready, go. So I heard, I heard some snippets from uh, several different conversations, some good things. One thing I heard was they were surrounded by good, they, they surrounded themselves with good friends. I think that's important. Especially when we look at our kids and the kinds of friends that they surround themselves with. That can make all the difference in the world. I mean, yes. And if our kids don't isolate into electronics and games, into, yeah. into non-human things. Another strategy of Satan. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, the influence of friends, and it looks like Daniel had some really good, solid friends in this situation. So, uh, what else? Um, we, we use the word good. I would use the word like-minded common foundation. Absolutely. Yeah, so, that's good. It's a good clarification. Yeah. Other thoughts you guys uh, chatted about? I know there's a lot of questions we had. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. It's because where did they learn this godly foundation? Yeah. At home. Mm -hmm. They learned it at home. So sure, they, they were in, in schools as well to learn the, the Torah and all that kind of stuff, but they learned this godly foundation at home. So um, there's no way that they could have uh, withstood these temptations without that, um, that training, that preparation. So I think preparation, like I said, is a, is a really key word, both in terms of the preparation they got at home, but also the personal preparation that you have to take, take on yourself to be able to withstand uh, the onslaughts of Satan. So, did anyone solve the last one? How, how can we consider it all joy? Cindy did. Oh, good. No, okay. Oh, good. No, but just in, in understanding the source of temptation, when a trial comes, we understand that we can choose to serve the accuser or serve the excuser in the trial, to be that ambassador or that embarrassment. We can choose how we respond to the trial. So in so doing, we can have the freedom and the joy of how to choose how to respond to the trial. That's all I have. Yeah. I think sometimes it's almost easier when it gets harder because it's clear. You know, as you were saying, when you're in luxury and it's all around you, it's very seducing. But when you start seeing terrible things happen by things that are going on, it makes, I think it stiffens your resolve. You know, because there's something, there's something to fight for. You begin to see more clearly what what your faith means. Yeah. When we look at the minor trial. 
problems that we face and compare them to the very desperate conditions that are in the other 99% of the world, we should be much more able to consider our trials with joy. I think also it's, it's uh, a starting place at least is understanding that this is the way God designed this world to work is that we have to go through the trials and the, and the mire and the muck to get to the glory, to be able to appreciate the glory. We had to go through this life of sin, constant sin terminated by death, be able to, to be able to understand what glory was all about. Otherwise we, we wouldn't have appreciated it. And so there are so many examples of that in, in life that... Uh, even though they are horrible and awful, and some trials we can't even fathom, some of the, the atrocities that ISIS is doing. It's just like some of these things are just, it just boggles the mind. But that is the, the process, is going through trials, and that's how you are strengthened and how you grow. Yeah. Oh, I'm just thinking two quotes from uh, Job. Is, uh, uh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And uh, my Redeemer lives. You know, in the midst of his trial, I mean, he never cursed God. Yeah. He was faithful the whole way. I don't think he was joyful, <laughs> but he was definitely not cursing God. Yeah, and that's you know, that's that's where the long term, long view, Roger, I think makes makes sense is understanding in the long term, this is what is going to serve to 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 uh, make me holy. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, um, Daniel and his friends that that at that age Nebuchadnezzar's thinking he can influence, brainwash, change their thinking, but they would have to in, in that crisis band together with a bond unlike they would have ever known otherwise and keep alive those things they remember that, that were part of their heritage part of who and what they were and I just think it's and there's a maturity probably in that time period yeah, we think of 13-year-olds today on skateboards or whatever, however we see them. But, but there, was, there was a maturity back then, I think, especially in, in that culture, that um, more than we would think of 13 today. Well, we have done that to our kids. We invented the term teenager in the last you know, few decades to give them an excuse to be youthful and irresponsible when 13 they became men back then and so they were forced to they were out in the fields working that kind and of thing. I think so. they prayed I mean their prayers were they asked God to define things for them to inform their prayers and I think in so doing they became prepared for what was ever to come during that day they could go <laughs> to the furnace yeah. yes yeah, so, so, isn't that amazing though that 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 uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon was so convinced they could easily mold and shape these 13 and 14 year olds. And God used these 13 and 14 year olds to mold and shape Nebuchadnezzar and change him and change his, his worldview and mindset. Yeah. I think the ability that how important the role was that God made us. But as they were trying to figure out what was going on, they were trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah. And that and that brings us back to the, the theme that I mentioned early on is that God is in control. And that's that's the message of Daniel. So last comment we got it. It's so inspiring just to see that that kind of faith is possible. And so we're going to get into more of this uh, chapter next time. We'll also get into chapter 2. So if you want to read ahead, read through chapter 2 and maybe even chapter 7 because they go, go along together. 
And we will jump in, we'll finish up chapter one next time and jump into chapter two as well. All right, sorry we kept you over time a little bit. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, we uh, are so grateful for this, um, uh, just a, a reveal, revealing of who you are in, in this uh, amazing book and, and a revealing of what's possible if we set our resolve, we set our mind, we, are, we purpose in our heart uh, to trust you, Lord. We thank you for uh, the example of the, these, these young men. And we uh, just ask that you um, help instill in us that same kind of resolve. Uh, we thank you for uh, the message that you are in control of history, that you are guiding and shaping all of the events here to accomplish your purpose and your will. Uh, go with us as we uh, leave this place and help us to keep our eyes focused on you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.